The Beatles' White Album is a classic, a mad schizophrenic double album which, when listened to from start to finish, sounds extremely jolting, confusing and a little bit insane. Many Beatles fans think it's no wonder that nutcase Charles Manson believed the Beatles were speaking to him through this album. It does sound like an audio dramatisation of madness when taken as a whole. But, probably, the craziest moment on the whole album is the penultimate track, Revolution 9. This song isn't really a song. It's over eight minutes of audio chaos, a montage of noise, sound and spoken word that has bewildered fans and critics for decades. Today, I want to take a closer look at that song and see if we can figure out at least a vague outline of what the hell it was supposed to mean. But, first of all, before we dive into the actual recording itself, we need to take a look at John Lennon and his strange fascination and connection with the number nine. Now, anyone who's done any kind of serious digging into the backstory of the Beatles will be aware that all of them, to varying degrees at different times, were into the occult at some point. The occult was so woven into the lives of the Beatles, particularly during their psychedelic phase, that when they opened their famous Apple boutique, to demonstrate that their business was going to be very different, they even hired a full-time mystic. His name was Caleb, and his chief role for over a year was to influence all company decisions by reading the tarot and throwing I Ching coins. Now, it's hard to say specifically because in interviews, the Beatles were typically pretty guarded about all this stuff. But to me, at least, my personal impression was that, of all of them, the one who was probably into it the most and who spoke about it the most was John Lennon. He famously wrote Tomorrow Never Knows, based around an lsd fueled reinterpretation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And, later on, he would become absolutely fascinated and obsessed with a slightly more obscure branch of the occult that used to be called arithmancy and is now known as numerology. Wikipedia defines numerology as the belief in an occult, divine or mystical relationship between a number and one or more coinciding events. It is often associated with the paranormal alongside astrology and is similar to divinatory arts. In his book, Beatles author Robert Rosen claims that Yoko and John took constant guidance in their life from a famous book of numerology called Cairo's Book of Numbers. He says, long before discovering numerology, John had been aware of the strong presence of the number nine in his life. John had always written off these facts as mere coincidence, though he did consider nine his lucky number. During his years of seclusion, Lennon dove headlong into numerology, which could be quickly applied to any situation to get a preliminary reading on the future. Like playing the lottery, it can be addictive. John and Yoko were unable to walk out of the house without finding mystical significance in every license plate, address and street sign. They would not so much as dial a telephone number without first consulting their Bible, Cairo's Book of Numbers. Journalist David Sheff interviewed John and Yoko in 1980 for an article in Playboy, and he seems to confirm what is reported here, suggesting he was apparently selected not because of his track record or skills, but arbitrarily because he was, according to numerology, a number nine. Here's what David Sheff himself said about the process of getting selected to take that interview. I sent letters to people in the music business, and one day I got a phone call from somebody, and he asked me when I was born and where I was born. And three or four days later, I got a call. Someone said, Yoko Ono wanted to meet me in New York. I got on a plane, and the next day I was having coffee with John Lennon. The interviewer next asked, was Yoko interested in your astrological sign or something like that when she asked? And Chef replied, I think it was my numerology. Apparently, my numbers were right. In fact, I think I was told later that my number was nine, which is the same number as John's. Lennon apparently went his whole life believing that the number nine held some kind of mystical significance to him. He himself traces it right back to his birthplace and birth date, saying, I lived in nine Newcastle Road. I was born on the 9th of October, the ninth month in the Chinese calendar. It's just a number that follows me around. 
Numerologically, apparently, I'm a number six or three or something, but it's all part of nine. And when you comb through John's story, the number nine does crop up a lot. While living at nine Newcastle Road, John wrote the song One After 909, which would feature on Let It Be. On the 9th of June, 1957, the first incarnation of the Beatles, the Quarrymen, had their first official engagement, an audition at the Empire Theatre in Liverpool. The Beatles, with their new name, played at the Cavern Club for the first time on Thursday the 9th of February, 1961. Their future manager, Brian Epstein, came across them exactly nine months later, on the 9th of November, 1961. After Brian Epstein became their manager, he managed to secure them a record deal with EMI on the 9th of May, 1962. The Beatles' famous televised appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show happened on February the 9th, 1964. Exactly five years to the day after Brian Epstein first saw The Beatles, again on November the 9th, 1966, John Lennon first met Yoko Ono. In 1968, John and Yoko began work in the studio on the song Revolution 9. Revolution 9 was released on their ninth UK studio album and famously features a sound clip of an engineer saying the words number 9, number 9, number 9, round and round, all the way throughout. The song, Revolution 9, apparently was also around 9 minutes long when it was originally recorded. According to the complete Beatles Chronicle, however, in the final edit of the song, almost a minute was edited out, but up until then, the song had also been around 9 minutes long. And of that song, Lennon said this in 1970. I had about 30 loops going, fed them onto one basic track. One thing was an engineer's testing voice saying, this is EMI test series number nine. I just cut up whatever he said and I'd number nine it. Nine turned out to be my birthday and my lucky number and everything. The group had become the Beatles in 1960 and John Lennon left in 1969, nine years later. John saw his estranged father, Alf, for the final time on the 9th of October, 1970. In 1974, Lennon released the song Number Nine Dream, which apparently he dreamt in its entirety, woke up and wrote down. Number Nine Dream, of course, reached number nine on the US Billboard 100. It was also released on his Walls and Bridges album, which included artwork he had drawn in 1952 at the age of 11 of a footballer wearing a number nine jersey. The next year, John and Yoko's son Sean was born on John's birthday, October the 9th, 1975. And at this stage, John Lennon's handwriting had also changed. Here is a sheet of lyrics he wrote in the 60s, and here is one from the 70s. Look at how he writes a capital I now. They are all number nines. Apparently, Yoko Ono was a massive influence on John Lennon in moving him closer to these kind of mystical, occult practices. When the Beatles recorded Revolution 9, John and Yoko had already been together a little while. According to the rap, after their marriage, John had immersed himself in numerology. With Yoko's guidance and that of her many astrologers, he governed his latter life according to her numbers. In one of his last interviews, he told Playboy magazine... She's the teacher and I'm the pupil. She's taught me everything I know. By 1978, the former Beatle told his tarot reader, John Green, The big plan is that I do nothing for the next four years. Mother, meaning Yoko, says that everything I do is doomed to fail until the year 1982. That year, according to the numbers, I'll conquer the world again. In Dakota days, Green writes of Lennon's dedicated mystical practices, his meditation, his psychic training, his cleansing fasts, his vows of silence, his tarot study. His card was the ninth, the hermit, representing contemplation and introspection. Of course, as we all know, John did not go on to reconquer the world in 1982, because he was tragically killed in 1980, and apparently numerology had played a role in John and Yoko selecting that particular place to live, they believed it had positive numerological implications for a number nine. In more recent years, the Beatles still seem to have been releasing material on dates that have been informed by numerology. For example, the Beatles released a complete set of remasters on the date 999, 
the 9th of September 2009 and many shops opened at 9am to sell them. The video game The Beatles Rock Band also came out on the same day, 999. So that's just a brief overview of the intense connection John Lennon felt to the number 9. John identified personally with the number 9, so I don't think it's too massive a leap to suggest that the title of Revolution 9 means John's Revolution, just as the title Number 9 Dream just meant John's Dream. So, now we have some understanding of the meaning and relevance of the number 9 to John Lennon. It seems to be John's numerological code for himself. So now, let's home in and take a closer look at the song Revolution 9. On the White Album, there are actually two John Lennon penned songs called Revolution. One called Revolution 1 and one called Revolution 9. Originally, however, they were meant to be all part of the same very long track. Revolution 9 started life on the 30th of May, 68. Take 20 of that song lasted more than 10 minutes. Mark Lewison describes the last six minutes as pure chaos with discordant instrumental jamming, feedback, John repeatedly screaming right, and then simply repeatedly screaming. Now, on the 2018 deluxe re-release of the White Album, we don't get to hear the entirety of Take 20, but we do get the complete Take 18, which is very similar to what Lewison describes. It's ten and a half minutes long, and it is both halves of the Revolution epic. The first part is the song Revolution 1, followed immediately within the body of the same track, with all the chaos that would become Revolution 9. What was that outro meant to be? Was there any meaning to it? And if so, what was it? In the Beatles anthology book, Lennon seems to give some kind of answer to this question by saying, Revolution 9 was an unconscious picture of what I actually think will happen when it happens, just like a drawing of a revolution. So, these tracks were meant to be two halves of the same story. Revolution 1 was talking about the revolution, and Revolution 9 was it actually happening. And that's a really revealing quote, because if you were to view the White Album as a concept album telling some kind of story, you could also choose to see Revolution 9, John's Revolution, actually taking place, as effectively the climax of the whole White Album storyline, the culmination of its message. In the track sequencing, it's the penultimate track, the apex of the crescendo, the final climactic battle scene, after which all that remains is the last song, Good Night, in which everyone is finally able to go to their beds in peace. Lennon said, It's a set of sounds, like walking down the street is a set of sounds, and I just captured a moment of time and put it on disc, and it's about that. It was maybe to do with the sounds of a revolution, so that's the vague story behind it. And so, of course, the next question we have to ask is, how vague was that story? Was the soundscape of Revolution 9 put together with some intentional message? Or was it just drug fueled self-indulgent experimentation? I think we have to at least consider the idea that there is some kind of message in this, because Lennon spent such an enormous amount of time on it. He said, I did a few mixes until I got one I liked. I spent more time on Revolution 9 than I did on half the songs I ever wrote. So now, let's take a look at the actual contents of the track itself. In the body of the song, we have two main audio elements, which are noises and sound effects and spoken word. And both of these elements kind of fade in and fade out, overlapping and interrupting one another right the way through. The sound effects include ever-escalating noise, backwards passages, quite scary sounding rushes and howls of backwards guitar and effects. As we might expect in a piece of audio artwork meant to depict a revolution, it's a bit like a crescendo, starting out fairly sedate and then building and building and building until it reaches a wild and quite overwhelming ending. The sound effects and loops play a huge role in this ever-building crescendo of pandemonium, but so too do the snatches of spoken dialogue. In the main body of the song, the majority of the spoken word consists of both John Lennon and George Harrison 
both reading nonsense prose and poetry over the top of each other, constantly, pretty much from start to finish. Almost every speech element in Revolution 9 consists of these two narratives from John and George, which fade in and out, often overlapping, so we only get little fragments of their sentences. And remembering what John said about this being like an audio painting of a revolution, it's almost as if you're in the chaos of the crowd on the ground as the revolution is happening all around you. You just hear little excerpts of confused and conflicting conversations. If you were to write them all down on a piece of paper in order, they would make no sense. But the tiny snippets you catch are enough to kind of build a picture of what's going on. So now we're going to dive into the lyrics, if you can even call them that. We're going to do our best, in amongst all the noise, to examine the spoken word sections of this song and see if they in any way line up with the idea of a revolution. The song starts with a conversation between Alistair Taylor and George Martin, in which Taylor apologises for forgetting to bring Martin a bottle of wine. He asks for forgiveness, Martin says OK, and Taylor calls him a cheeky bitch. So, we start out with the mildest of mild confrontations. But this smallest of small fallouts is only the starting point, and from here on in, the sense of acrimony, the sense of increasing aggravation in the little snatches of overheard conversation only increases. So, after opening with this funny little section between Taylor and Martin, a sombre piano piece starts to play. And then, the voice of the engineer repeatedly saying, number nine, kicks in, panning wildly from left to right. We get a brief blaring of military trumpets, and then we go into the next section of spoken word. Now, in the normal mix of the song, it's really hard to pick out all the overlapping stuff that John, George and Yoko are saying, the spoken word dialogue that's buried down in the bed of the track. However, in 2018, with the deluxe version of the White Album, there was also, for the first time, a 5.1 surround sound mix of the album released on the Blu-ray. Which meant that those of us who know how to fiddle around with this stuff were able to isolate each of those five tracks and kind of cut out each little section of speech and hear it clearly, probably for the first time ever in Beatles history. So what I did in preparation for making this video was I listened through every single track, all five channels of Revolution 9, individually, one at a time, with enormous patience, and extracted all the moments where I could hear speech. I then rendered it as one part and ran it through a stem splitter to remove all the instrumentation. Having extracted all the speech I could, I then had a crack at transcribing it. But even in that condition, you've still got John and George talking over the top of each other the whole time. Never helped by the repeated loops of number nine, number nine, over the top as well. But as so much of this is just nonsense prose anyway, hopefully any inaccuracies of transcription on my part shouldn't matter too much. Remember, this song is meant to be a kind of audio painting. The specific words matter less than the overall impression. So now let's listen to the first of the overlapping dialogues from John and George. Lennon's voice is the loudest, so that's the one that I've attempted to transcribe here. Oh, him, Mrs. Welsh, red in pair of soft brown underpants, worn by the great Duke of Marlborough in the early days of his Renaissance speech. The shortage in grain in Hertfordshire. Every one of them knew that as time went by they'd get a little bit older and a little bit slower. In the early days they used to all go to hand in factory work. There was always a routine type of hardly job miners in the in the in the districts that they really intended to pay for. The whole road system was disrupted and the whole concrete thing fell long right. So Looking at this dialogue, and bearing in mind that Lennon said it's kind of like being out on the street and catching snatches of conversation, what can we gather? There's a shortage of grain in Hertfordshire. We hear about factory workers. We hear the phrase, intended to pay for. And then we hear, the whole road system was disrupted. And so, from that, you can at least piece together the vague interpretation that a revolution could be starting. People are running out of food. Factory workers, who are not paid much anyway, 
have had to take something that they intended to pay for. Then we hear the whole road system has been disrupted. We could choose to interpret this as painting an audio picture of the protests beginning. Next we move into another section full of overlapping sounds that are increasing in intensity. Borderline insane hysterical female laughter bursts out of the right speaker and the noise of a gurgling baby leaps out of the left while George Harrison says who was to know in the background. All the while number nine, number nine, number nine fading in and out. And then we go into the next section of spoken dialogue but because the song has become so chaotic as it's built and built and built by this point the stem splitter really struggled to get anything usable from the track. So for the next section I've turned to the transcription that was uploaded for this song onto Spotify. I've no idea if this is actually the official transcription or not, but it's the best we have right now, so let's take a look at it and see what it says. The lyrics on Spotify show six conversation fragments. The first one says, I sustained nothing worse than. Next one, also for example, whatever you're doing. The fourth one says, a business deal falls through. Then, I informed him on the third night. And lastly, unfortunately he was. Now, as we are kind of trying to assemble some kind of theme in all this chaos, the first fragment and the fourth fragment are the most interesting to me because, again, they seem to suggest that slow, gradual increase in hostilities. I sustained nothing worse than suggests someone sustained presumably, some kind of minor injury. A business deal has also fallen through, so we do once again see the strange, surreal threads of a developing protest, a developing story. We now move into the next sound montage section, where there is the sound of an angry crowd, there's a sound like a siren in the background. And then, as a choir starts singing, John Lennon starts repeatedly screaming the word, right. We move straight back out of the montage into the next set of overlapping dialogue. So when it comes yes. time, you will bet the restored you to every few days later. In a pair of round with the situation. They are standing still upon the telegram. And here's the Spotify transcription of that section. I've missed all of that. It makes me a few days late. Compared with, like, wow. And weird stuff like that. Taking our sides sometimes. Floral bark. Rogue doctors have brought this specimen. On heat with the situation. They are standing still. Upon the telegram. So, once more... Remembering this is an audio painting, it's not meant to make sense read in that linear way. Let's see if we can pick out fragments of conversation that make sense in the context of the revolution. Now we have a situation developing. People are taking sides. We have a doctor mentioned. Remember, in the previous spoken word section, someone said, I sustained nothing worse than a... implying a very minor injury... Well, here now we have the doctors being called. Perhaps slightly more serious injuries are occurring as Revolution 9 progresses. And this section of speech closes with the phrases They are standing still upon the telegram. The protesters will not be moved and there is apparently also some communication going on between the two sides. Someone has sent a telegram. Of course, all of this is just my interpretation. There are millions of ways of interpreting what this is really saying, but this is just one possible way of the many of threading all of it together. Next, we have John Lennon making kind of ghost noises which come bursting out of the right-hand speaker with a kind of tremolo effect on them. And then the spoken word continues, and there's another little section here that has been revealed by the stem splitter that I couldn't really hear in the main mix. Doctors made a false as the headmaster reported. Who could tell what he was saying? His voice was low and his eye was high. It's a quite ironic little comment from John Lennon. He clearly seems to be talking about himself in this submerged moment. You can't tell what he's saying. His voice is very low in the mix. 
and let's be honest, he probably was high as a kite while he was making this. And now we move once again out of dialogue into another sound montage, and this time you can hear a crowd and they sound really angry. The escalation is continuing. There are car horns and cymbal crashes, and all the while, number nine, number nine, number nine, going on in the background. Huge bangs and crashes, and what sounds like explosions. And then, at the end of this montage section, the crowd explode into applause. Immediately after which, we go into the next section of speech from John. Oh, let me better go to see us. Yeah, I want the clothes. So, any road, he went to see the dentist instead and gave him a pair of teeth, which wasn't any good at all. So, so instead of that, he joined the 40 Navy and went to see. Over the top of this section of speech, the song intensifies further as we have this utterly evil sounding bass line kicking in and John screaming in the background. There's also a very fast high tremolo guitar part that turns this section into the darkest sounding one yet. So there we have the next escalation in injury levels. We started out with that very very mild confrontation between Taylor and Martin. Then we had someone saying I sustained nothing worse than a then we had someone talking about a doctor, and now we have someone needing a surgeon. In amongst all the nonsense, you could interpret it as having a kind of theme, if you choose to see it that way. And where we previously had the suggestion of people protesting, now we have our first reference to something military. An organised armed force joining the Navy. And as John's strange story about joining the Navy and going to sea fades out, we hear American football chants kicking in. The crowd are now chanting and supporting their side in the conflict. And then, as the chanting crowd reach a crescendo, everything cuts out and we suddenly have what feels like a jolting scene change. A ghostly choir suddenly ring out from the left speaker and the sound of a fire crackling comes out of the right. And buried down in the mix, John starts narrating something slightly different. Let's look at this passage which I've taken from Spotify. In my broken chair, my wings are broken and so is my hair. I'm not in the mood for whirling. Dogs were dogging, cats were catting, birds were birding and fish were fishing. Them for theming and whim for whimming. Only to find the night watchman unaware of his presence in the building. Now I don't know what that conjures up in your mind, but that first line, in the context of this song, taken with the sudden jolting scene change in the audio picture, to me it sounds like we've gone from the revolutionaries on the ground to the scene of the king that they would like to overthrow. He's recognising that his throne is broken, his wings are broken, and his hair is broken. I think that is a bit more John Lennon wordplay for air. At this stage, of course, I'm using loads of artistic license to kind of make sense of it, and I could be way off, but that's just how it seems to me. He was not in the mood for celebration, while everyone else outside the walls was making a noise like wild animals. You can imagine the king sitting defeated on his broken throne as all the country, all about, rises up against him. And the lyrics suggest someone has got into the building who has managed to slip in under the nose of the night watchman. I wonder who might be sneaking into the palace to find the king on his broken throne. An assassin, perhaps? I think this could be the kind of crescendo scene of the whole song, because it starts out almost silent, and bit by bit, throughout this little speech from John, the sounds of the revolution get louder and louder and louder, until you can hear smashes and bangs and crashes and fire and explosions overwhelming everything in the speakers. It's as if the revolutionaries are drawing near to the palace and surrounding it. After a very short interval of cymbal crashes and number nines, we go straight in to the last little section from John. He says, Industrial output, financial imbalance, thrusting it between his shoulder blades, the Watusi, the twist. George then says, El Dorado. And John finishes by saying, Take this, brother, may it serve you well. 
So, in the context of this hypothetical story that we're kind of building together, we had the idea that someone had snuck into the palace under the nose of the night watchman. And now we have something being thrust between someone's shoulder blades and given a twist. It sounds like the assassin just cut the head off the king, doesn't it? This sounds to me like it could be a revolutionary execution of the old leader. If you recall, in the previous passage, the man in his broken chair didn't want to dance. Ironically, he ends up dancing with the assassin, who kills him. Immediately after this, we hear the phrase El Dorado, the arrival of the mythical promised land. The old oppressive regime has been done away with, and utopia can now begin. And then, the last phrase, take this brother, may it serve you well. The assassin passes on the weapon to his brothers in the revolution. And, interestingly, from the moment we get the phrase thrusting it between his shoulder blades, the music changes back to the sad, sombre piano part that we heard right at the beginning. And right after George Harrison says El Dorado, implying that now the new world can begin, we get the tiniest snatch of what sounds like a national anthem. And so, with that moment, the actual story of the revolution finishes, and we go into a strange little outro section in which Yoko Ono actually seems to be talking to us, the listeners. In this tiny little outro section, Yoko Ono is talking through what sounds like a slightly detuned radio. This is how Spotify transcribes her speech. Maybe it's nothing. Lennon says, what? What? Oh. And Yoko continues to say, maybe even then. Exposure to London could be a difficult thing. It's quick, like a rush for peace is, because it's so much. It was like being naked. If you become naked. And as Yoko Ono's strange psychedelic speech finishes, the song ends with the sound of American football chants, hold that line and block that kick, echoing out of both speakers and then slowly fading out. Almost as a postscript, Yoko says, exposure to London could be a difficult thing. It's quick, like a rush for pieces. What would be difficult to expose London to? And what is the rush for peace? Is this her suggesting that this kind of revolution could take place here in the UK, starting in London? We're almost at the end now, but just quickly, I want to give you a bit of context of what was going on in the world at this time, in 1968. I want to quickly share with you this comment I read on the Beatles Bible website, which I felt was really apt when interpreting and understanding this track. Where were you in 1968? I was 17. MLK and RFK were assassinated. There were race riots, cities burned, anti-Vietnam demonstrations. All over Europe, there were student demonstrations. When MLK was killed, there were army tanks in the field behind our house. There was a police riot in Chicago. The first time I heard Revolution No. 9, it made perfect sense to me. In retrospect, it still does. It is 1968. 1968 was a pretty crazy year. But the biggest protests and the biggest rumblings of a revolution weren't actually in America. They were just over the channel in France. And one of the most fascinating things about the recording and the making of Revolution 9 is the exact little window in history when it was made. Listen to this from Wikipedia. Beginning in May 1968, a period of civil unrest occurred throughout France, lasting seven weeks, punctuated by demonstrations, general strikes and the occupation of universities and factories. At the height of events, the economy of France came to a halt. The protests reached a point that made political leaders fear civil war or revolution. The national government briefly ceased to function after President Charles de Gaulle secretly fled France to West Germany on the 29th. Now look at how the timing of this French revolutionary activity lined up perfectly with the making of Revolution 9. The revolutionary activity in France ran from May the 2nd, 1968 until June the 23rd of the same year. Revolution 9 was recorded from May the 30th up until June the 21st. This recording, which we might interpret as the call for a revolution in Britain, was made right in the middle 
of a huge revolution going on at that exact moment in France. So that's what I think could be the actual meaning to this song. Of course, I could be wrong, and I'm also not 100% convinced. Lennon was, in reality, a very peaceful guy and not actually into violent protest at all. So bearing the reality of how he actually protested, how would you interpret this song? Interestingly, around the same time, there were small gestures towards some kind of mini-revolution in the UK, but it was pretty much just students. In May of 1968, there was a sit-in by students at the Guildford School of Arts. Some members of the staff supported the striking students and were sacked. The sacked staff from Guildford and Hornsey Schools of Art held exhibitions of their work. John Lennon and Yoko Ono came to show support, and while in attendance, they distributed sheets of A4 paper on which was written, Fold this nine times. No one succeeded. So, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll leave you with this tantalising thought. If Revolution 9 serves as the great crescendo, the final battle in the story of the White Album, ushering in El Dorado, what is the story of the rest of the album leading up to it? Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll see you next time.